Let's go ahead, uh, Dr. Shivani. Uh, you know, I think uh, our other speakers will suddenly come and want to speak. So, Dr. Shivani is going to talk to us about expanding indications of phacic lenses and orange lights. So, please come. She's a brilliant uh, refractive and cataract surgeon from Bombay, and uh, is doing great work. She's been winning awards. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Gaurav sir, for considering me to fill in for this uh, part of the course. It's been an honor to accept. Um, so uh, everybody today I'll be talking about phacic IOLs and expanding their indications. So um, in our practice, phacic IOLs, yes, they are also as huge a part as laser vision correction because patients nowadays are quite uh, aware of the refractive error that they have. They, because of the advancement of technology, we have YouTube which is explaining exactly what we do in the surgery. They don't have to wonder what, what is LASIK, how is it done, if I have a minus one, minus two, minus 10, what is my future ahead with this? And majorly we get patients who are young who want to get this done around the time of their marriage or after their college education is over when they have some free time to recuperate from the surgery. So these well-informed patients, um, mostly we used to have two schools of thought. One was when I started learning and when I started getting my training from my seniors and even with Dr. Kumar, Dr. and Dr. Gaurav sir, I always had this question in my mind, if um, the cornea is getting compromised, why would we go for a laser vision correction and why not ICL for everybody who has a deep AC? So the answers I would get was obviously it is an invasive procedure. Conversion becomes difficult. It is difficult to convince the patient to undergo a surgery. There are complications which are not very commonly seen with laser as we see with phacic ICL, I mean phacic IOLs or ICLs. But nowadays with the advancement of techniques and the ICL at the way it has progressed, these indications widen. We have a wider range and there are some indications which are absolute no-no for patients who are keratoconic, patients who have had keratoplasty. Let's go ahead and see these indications. So we know what phacic IOLs are. They are artificial lenses implanted in the anterior posterior chamber of the eye in the presence of the natural crystalline lens to neutralize the corrective, uh, refractive error. So um, we all know laser vision correction going from PRK to LASIK to uh, now re like SMILE or uh, lenticle procedures now coming back to PRK again. But the level of comfort is high. That's why people pref prefer these procedures. They even come asking for specific procedures. Nowadays with a lot of machines, they come asking for those machines as well. There's a quick recovery process. It's minimally invasive, which is what attracts them. Uh, both eyes are done together. They're very happy with that fact that they don't have to undergo the same procedure twice all over again. And stable, predictable results, retreatments, maybe hardly there with experienced people. Ability to perform bilateral treatment, no lab tests required. That's a big plus because in today's fast times, people don't want to go for a lab test and come back for the surgery. Minimize the number of visits to the clinic. No ordering of the lens availability, which is a factor in ICL. Except now when a patient, all patients that come to our clinic are not normal. Some of them who have a high power are also having ectatic corneas or pre-ectatic corneas. Now again, with the advancement of the machinery that we have, even a small bit of ectasia puts us in doubt whether we should go ahead with a refractive procedure for this particular patient or should we step back. So this doubt, sometimes we always move towards safety and precaution instead of just going ahead with it. We always prefer to take an orange light in those situations rather than proceeding with a corneal procedure. Because if the patient comes back with an ectasia to us, we are again stuck. So, and these are patients who are 6'6", six, six. we are trying to give them 6'6 six, six back. So we don't want them to come back with a complication where they never be 6'6 six, six or the quality will never be great. So in risk of iatrogenic keratectasia, when excessive ablation is done or residual bed is too thin, or we see orange lights on the um, planner or else we see any sp steepening which cannot be explained, any epithelial mapping which is irregular and we predict excessive inflammation post-op, the quality of vision will not be that great. We should move for a phacic IOL, ICL instead. Induction of uh, tear film abnormalities, induction of higher order aberrations. So tear film abnormality is extremely common in uh, cities as well as everywhere these days because of dryness. It's an epidemic, pandemic sort of. Uh, higher order aberrations leading to poor contrast sensitivity, limitation of night vision, especially high cylindrical powers. Although number of years these incidences are dropping, number of years the laser correction of higher diopter has dropped as we understand healing of cornea and corneal response to laser correction. Advantages of ICLs in these conditions are preservation of architecture of the cornea, re predictable refractive results. In 
a long practice as well, we'll see cases where the vaulting has become unusually high and it's an unpredictable error. The white to white is normal, everything, gonioscopy, you did a UBM as well, but suddenly there's a high vault that we see which, is, which can't be explained. There has been an error somewhere. But these complications, even in high volume ICL practices, as one extremely informative course that every time I attend in all conferences by Dr. Kamal Kapoor, it's, it, he's the one who inspired me to do more. So in th that as well, these surprises are there, but they're rare in uh, hands who have already done many ICLs. So preservation of accommodation, reversible and adjustable, no costly equipment required. Uh, so no LASIK unit of M2 unit necessary, not everyone can afford it. Shorter learning curve while performing. Indications can be any refractive error which is unsuitable for laser, vi laser vision correction, as I said. Myopia beyond nine, now even refractive errors as low as minus four diopter can be corrected. Corneal thickness less than 430 and residual bed which is likely to be compromised after laser, laser vision correction. So we went from Benedetto to Bekoff to now artisan lenses. We have options of anterior and posterior and iris fixated. Of course, we go for posterior most commonly. Older ones had variety of complications like IOP spikes, pigment dispersion, cataract. Not saying it never happens now, but the incidence is much, much less. Eliminates the need for a peripheral PI nowadays because of the central uh, uh, hole outflow system. Uh, now powers range from minus two diopters to minus 20 diopters. Toric correction up to six diopters advantages of smart torics are available where you just implant them at 180 and there is no rotation required, no alignment required. So smart torics are now available. Extremely thin with an optic center measuring 50 microns, haptic 500 microns. So this makes it really easy for the placement as well as uh, less uh, chances of vaulting errors, less chances of rubbing against the uh, structures and causing glaucoma or cataract. Overall diameter is also a wide variety. Sizing depends on white to white measurements. We have excellent modalities and online methods available to measure it yourself. You can even ask the company to do it for you. It's extremely easy and lucid these days and results are quite predictable and uh, meticulous. ACD, Schaffer grade two or above, we are, our cutoff at our center is 2.8, very rare 2.75, but 2.70 I've seen people do it. Material we all know it's hydrophilic collagen polymer. So the prerequisites, we would say more than 21 years uh, because studies say so, we've done younger patients. Stable refractive error, adequate ACD is required. Good endothelial cell count is required. Uh, white to white is required, which is which should be normal. And no ocular pathology like pre-existing iritis, cataract, glaucoma, retinal pathologies. As with any other case of any other surgery, pre-existing pathologies will compromise the result of your surgery, whether it is a laser surgery, whether it is cataract surgery, whether it is ICL. So that is something that is common for every surgery. And uh, now broadened indications, range of refractive errors corrected. So corneal thickness is not compromised even with a high range refractive error. Astigmatism can be taken care of without compromising the night vision of the patient. Customized toric power is available and unilateral high refractive errors like an isometropia can be easily corrected. Patient who has keratoconus, it's a very common disease. Uh, we all know the nitty gritties of keratoconus. Stable keratoconus for two years we can treat safe and predictable, no tissue loss, so we are not worried about that. In unstable keratoconus, where we know that the cone is not central, we can stabilize the cone with a uh, C3, uh, C3 with, a, with an intact segment, intracorneal ring segment. We can do that. Once it is central, we can do an ICL. We've done this. It's worked beautifully in the past. Sorry, I'll take a few more minutes. So combination procedure of intracorneal ring segment, C3R and fake IOL is safe. For progressive KC, we can combine it with a DALC or uh, uh, procedure as well. Boon for contact lens intolerant patients, many uh, exist, many such patients exist who get allergic symptoms. GPC, which is extremely intolerable for the patient. Myopic astigmatism can be treated in those cases. Reversible and adjustable for future refinements for toric alignment. Post keratoplasty, clear corneal graft with high astigmatism or spherical error. We predict this in all keratoplasty patients. Good endothelial cell count and deep ACD is required. Posterior PIOs are preferred in such cases. Residual refractive error correction. Piggyback IOL for pseudophagic eyes, the easiest thing to do. Symptomatic cases can be treated with this method. Use of piggyback IOLs with adequate ACD, of course. Press biopia, um, not much, I don't have much experience in this to be honest, but there are multifocal diffractive IOLs present. Pediatric PIOLs are also available. Now, Indian versus imported, it's about the cost because I've seen results which are quite comparable. 
Um, there are 2.8 millimeter incision compatible injectors, comparable visual outcomes, standby IOL is provided, designed with a 350 micron central drainage hole, no iridectomy needed. So in conclusion, I would just like to say that broaden in indications for fake IOLs, choose your patient wisely. If the patient is not willing for an in, uh, invasive procedure, those patients have to be explained the pros and cons of the residual refractive error. Some patients are comfortable. I have seen <coughs> that um, in my limited practice, I have seen that it is important for knowing to know what the patient's <coughs> requirement is. Some patients feel that if more than 70% of their glass power can be deducted, if they're wearing a minus 10, minus 12, minus 15, then if they're left with a residual of say minus three, they, they don't mind wearing glasses sometimes. Very few. Some of them want a complete removal of the glasses because they've lived too long with those thick glasses. Getting up in the morning and hunting for those glasses being the first thing is a really troublesome thing for them. So it is, I think, a good option to consider to switch to fake IOL, I mean, ICLs for that case. And they do come asking for ICLs these days because, as I said, patients are quite aware of what their condition is. And of course, they have taken opinions at many places. So they come asking for ICLs. The cost factor is there, but I think it's. We have an option of Indian versus imported as well. Mm -hmm. We can explore that. And patient counseling is extremely important. Having told them that they can have complications, whereas hearing from uh, LASIK that it is a daycare procedure, you can go back. And I mean, the recovery time is a little easier on them, and complications are a little lesser. They do tend to move towards why not LASIK. But if the safety factor is high, I think we should go for the safer procedure. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Dr. Shivani. That was a very nice, um, uh, com com you know, comprehensive information. I have a quick question, uh, Dr. Chitra. Um, since you your center does a lot of fake lenses, what's your threshold now? Have you, has it changed over the years? Like, at what far do you start thinking of moving from a laser correction or a corneal-based procedures to a to a fake And first, we'll take both of you. Uh, quick. So, uh, in my practice, I beyond 6.5 or 7, I hesitate to do any corneal procedure for the simple reason I have my own reasons of. Uh, I feel it may affect the contrast of the patient. Why should I unnecessarily change the biomechanics of the cornea? So by my cutoff would be upper limit is seven. Only if the patient insists and the cornea still has a reasonable tissue there, I would approach. Otherwise, I just fold my hands and say bye to them. And I said, you can go and get operated somewhere else. But to my surprise, there are some patients, some surgeons uh, known to me who are probably operating at 9, 10, 11 also. And uh, they are doing it which is fine, my cutoff is around 6.57 is tops. Dr. Chitra, mm. what's your cutoff? Like, uh, at what part does your center start offering uh, fake lens? Actually, uh, nowadays, irrespective of uh, the corneal thickness beyond minus eight, we have shifted to doing fake IOLs. And uh, because we do believe that there is some amount of aberrations which are caused on the cornea when you're treating higher parts. And, uh, and if the, how low would we go? Supposing a person has a minus three and has a, a 438 or 440 cornea and all, I would do a fake ECIO for those patients. Now that said, ma'am, I, I get your point, but yeah. there are other centers which yeah. are now, which don't own an examer and offer ICL or fake yeah. lens as the only option. Now, yeah. is that a great idea? See, it's an intraocular procedure. And, uh, uh, and, and like just like a fake code, there is a learning curve to it. There's a lesser of a learning curve to a a laser refractive procedure because if you have the topography and you understand the basic dictums, it's easier to do. And these are very young eyes. So incidentally, your incision goes and does a lunch touch and there is some miscalculation. And there could be anything, even an endophthalmitis could rarely occur. So unless it is, uh, if there is an alternative, like a laser vision correction for simpler parts, we need not do it. Now, I would not motivate the patient sitting in front of me with a minus three and tell her, get fakey, I will fake it. No, I won't do that. If she's crazy about doing, all her relatives have got it done, and her cornea thickness is, or, uh, is not going to allow, then I would suggest uh, fakey cayule, and I would be very strict that anterior chamber depth is 2.8 millimeters or more, not otherwise. Thank you. So, Kamal, you had a quick uh, thing, yeah. and then we'll move yeah, on because uh, we are running out of time uh, now. Shivani, you just mentioned everything. I think two points I'd like to mention here is, always do measure the angle too. Yes, because yes. with my large experience of pupil size, angle, and the clear lens rise. These three things you probably skip because they play an important role. I was just in another session doing an IC on fakey lenses, and uh, Sanjay Chaudhary 
presented four cases where he said that the vault was 750, 800 and the lens kept rotating. So I told him I've got nine such cases on retrospective I found their CLR was minus, which means the clear lens, the lens, crystalline lens was practically vaulted backwards. So in these situations, so you should have a CLR angle measurement. In my hands, I've seen 15 to 18 uh, degrees of angle shallowing when you use a fakie lens. So if you have a pre-surgery angle of 30, you should be a little careful. And even if you, you should not think that if it is 2.7, I'll do an YAG PI and I can place the lens. It does not help at all. And uh, in case you have a patient with a high void, it has happened in spite of the fact that everything was fine, then you should actually follow up these patients, do a serial gonioscopy and then take a call. If things are changing, you may have to remove the lens too. The so saving grace is that some patients over five to seven months will keep losing the vault. Yes. Uh, you know, they tend to make their place on the zonules, yes. but you cannot bet on it all the time. But Kamal, uh, I also wanted to point out here that literature says that, you know, 20 microns of vault is, uh, you know, lost per annum. And, you know, over 10 to 15 years, you yeah. may actually end up using between 100 to 200 microns easily. So if you're leaving behind a very low vault, yes. that's why I'm not going to offer fake lenses as my first choice. I would yes. still do laser correction as my yes. first choice. Mm -hmm. And where laser correction is not indicated because laser correction has stood the test of time over 25, 30 years and we still have patients doing great. So mm -hmm. it's, I would only do fake lens when there was an indication and not just offering it.